Welcome to a WGBH News special presentation. Boston is the greatest city on earth. For over 20 years, Mayor Tom Menino has led the transformation of Boston. Now, Boston elects a new leader, 12 candidates seeking to write the next chapter for the economic and cultural capital of New England. It's an election 2013 special, a Boston mayoral forum. Good evening, I'm Emily Rooney. Welcome to our viewers on WGBH Channel 2 and our listeners on 89.7 FM WGBH Radio. All this week, we're hosting the 12 candidates running for mayor of Boston. Each night, I sit down with three candidates selected at random for a one-hour discussion on the issues facing the city, issues that affect not just residents, but anyone who comes to town for dinner, to go to school, or take a job. I'd like to welcome tonight's candidates. Bill Walzak is a community organizer who co-founded the Codman Square Health Center in 1979. He's now a business executive in the private sector and has been a resident of Dorchester since the 1970s. Charles Yancey has been a city councilor since 1983, representing District 4, which includes Dorchester. He grew up in Roxbury and now resides in Dorchester. Tonight's third candidate, Charles Clemens, was invited to attend but has declined to show up. So we are going to proceed <laughs> with a forum of two of the Thank 12 you. mayoral candidates. Welcome to both of you. Happy to be Bill here. And Charles. Good. And I just want to mention I also represent Mather Pan. Yeah, well, we didn't list all the districts, but I understand. <laughs> all right. Um, I, I thought I'd just should start tonight because um, I know both of you pretty well, but just for people who don't have a good sense of you, uh, starting with you, Bill, why have you decided to jump into this race? Well, I've spent my entire adult life uh, working in my community and across Boston to try to make the city of Boston a better place. Uh, I'm a, the founder of the Codman Square Health Center. I co-founded two schools in Boston. I'm a co-founder of Boston Medical Center. I've done work overseas. And I, I started thinking about when Mayor Menino decided to leave, um, that, uh, that this would be a great opportunity if you really cared deeply about the city of Boston, that, that the mayor's office is the perfect place to be to improve the school system, make sure Boston's ready for, uh, for global warming, to build the strongest economy we possibly can. I'm the kind of person that really, I enjoy the idea of being able to get things done and move, uh, move my city forward, and uh, that's why I decided to run. I heard you say a few minutes ago you consider yourself more of a leader than a legislator. Yeah, I would never have considered ever uh, uh, running for the legislature or the city council because I like running things, to be quite frank. Um, I'm a person that uh, has been a CEO for most of my life, for 32 years as CEO. I'm currently a vice president of a large uh, construction company in Boston, and, uh, and I do really, really enjoy making things happen. That's, that's basically what I do. I make things happen. Charles, you've had a stellar career on the council. Yeah. Why jump out of that now? And get I know you're actually technically running for both. Yes, races. my name is on the ballot for District 4 City Council, but I'm running for mayor um, because I love the city of Boston, love the people in it. I've had a tremendous amount of success on the city council, building two community centers, um, the most technologically advanced branch library in the city of Boston, and the police station. So I believe in public service, and I think the city of Boston, the city government, has a special role to play in dealing with public safety, public education, with housing. And I believe that um, as mayor of Boston, I can get a lot more done than I was able to get done as a city councilor, even though I have uh, managed to see the results of my labor. Every time you see a Boston public school bus, I want you to think about Charles Yancey because it, every bus has a crossing gate on the front bumper. I enacted the legislation that requires that because children all around the United States of America were actually being run over by the school buses. And that a crossing, crossing gate is attached yeah. to the front bumper of every school bus. Very low tech, nothing very sexy about it, but it saves lives. And the point is, as mayor of Boston, I can get even more done. For example, uh, for the last 15 years I've been trying to build a new high school because Boston doesn't have enough high schools. It certainly does not have a state-of-the-art high school. The last time we constructed one was when Jimmy Carter was president of the United States in 1979. And there have been dozens of new high schools constructed around the city of Boston throughout Massachusetts since the last time we built one. Our first-class students deserve first-class facilities. 
So that's one of the things I want to do as mayor. But I'm also going to change the tone in city government. I want to make sure that each of our 17,000 employees understand that they really do work for the public. And I'm going to insist that all of the em employees treat the public with dignity and respect. And I think in return, I uh, will receive the support from the public. So after my first term in the city of Boston, Boston is going to be known as the cleanest city in the city of Boston. Yeah, we're going to get into it's that a little bit more. It's going to be known as the safest and the city with the well, best schools. I hope you're schools. right about that, Charles. Yes. All right, getting into some of the issues here, um, Fire Chief Stephen uh, Abrero was brought in in 2011 to change things around, to really rearrange the department. He essentially got run out of town after the Boston Marathon bombing because the rank and file said he didn't step up enough to meet the challenge of, of his responsibilities. None of us lay people really know what happened. But is this an example of the union kind of run amok in your mind, Bill, or was this something that he eventually resigned over the criticism? But can anyone stand up to the unions? Yes, and we need to. Uh, management needs to run the city of Boston. We need to work with our unions, but management needs to run the city. And, uh, and I can tell you that uh, I was aghast when I heard uh, it was an official from the fire department that said, we've been doing these things uh, for the past 300 years. We know what we're doing. I mean, are you kidding me? Uh, <laughs> this is not the way we need to operate a 21st century city. We need to modernize our fire department, and we need to p deploy our resources most effectively. So what we need is a top-down, you know, from the top to the bottom uh, evaluation of, of all of our departments. But if you're looking at the fire department, yeah, let's take a look at it. The Boston Globe had a, a story out a couple of weeks ago that talked about some of our barracks uh, having a lot of action, a lot of work done, a lot of fires that they report, uh, reported to, uh, and others that almost had nothing. Well, that's a misdeployment of resources. We staff these um, fire stations for 24-7, uh, fully staffed. And we need to make sure that we're doing the good job of deploying the resources most efficiently, most efficiently, most effectively, and that's what good management will do. So my plan with the fire department is uh, we're going to take a top to down, top to bottom uh, look at it and make sure that we're deploying resources effectively. And and we'll also have to deal with the issue of who re, um, responds to uh, to medical emergencies. Right now we have the fire department and the emergency medical services re responding to these. And it seems to me a duplication of resources. So we need to take a look at that. There may be reasons why we do it, and there may be reasons why it's a waste of money. So we need to take a, a look at it and make sure that we change the fire department so that it is a 21st century modernized and effective organization. In fact, there are some 34 stations still open. There were a bunch of closings, as you know, Charles, in the 70s and 80s. It yes. haven't been in a long time. Yes. But Bill is right. Over 90% of the calls that the fire department responds to are non-fire related, yes. which didn't used to be the case when you got to the city council. That's there was, true. There was but many I, more fires. Would you yes. consolidate, would you take even a step to close some of the fire departments? Uh, if necessary, after I review not only the fire department, the, but the police department, the EMS, even though they work out of the uh, Public Health Commission. But I would differ with uh, my good friend on the issue of responding to emergencies. The act of saving a life, I think, is paramount in all of this. So if there's a shooting or a stabbing near a firehouse, and the firefighters can get there before the EMS, then I want the fire department to respond. If there's uh, someone in cardiac arrest on the streets of Boston, and if a police vehicle can get there before fire or EMS, I want the police vehicle to arrive. I have, ha I have actually proposed legislation which would require every Boston police vehicle to be equipped with an automatic electronic defibrillator uh, because seconds count, as, as Bill knows. Uh, so I would uh, take a little bit of different tact uh, in terms of looking at uh, efficiencies. We must do everything okay, possible Charles, to wait, save wait, lives. We didn't, we're not in disagreement. What I said was we need to evaluate. But you're talking about duplication effective. of right. effort. We, we need to make sure and that we're given deploying the appropriately. Given the context of what's been actually going on in the city of Boston, the city government, where there has been this tension between the EMS and the firefighters, and the fact that in many instances we have failed to deploy our fire 
uh, department to respond to some of these medical emergencies resulted they all respond. In, in but, one, but no, Charles, no, did that's you know, not true. Did in, you in, know one instance, in one no instance, way. there was actually loss of life because the fire department did well, not respond. Poor management. Yeah. I mean, did you know that there's no way to recall a false alarm? If I'm burning my chicken livers, there's no way, and my thing goes off, there's no way to say it's not a fire. Shouldn't that talk about a, a waste of resources? No. Shouldn't there be a way to do a reverse 911 and say it's not an emergency? Oh, sure. I, I agree with can't that. do it. I, I also need to I look at the call boxes, too. And, you know, it, it seems to me that uh, call boxes are mainly a waste of time, a waste of money. You know, we're looking at uh, call boxes when virtually everyone has a, a cell phone. So, you know, whether we need them or not and whether we're willing to pay the kind of uh, amount of dollars per per year that it costs to maintain that uh, ancient system is, is something that really needs to be evaluated. We need to deploy more resources towards the things that are important, such as education, early childhood education in particular. Uh, and we're going to need to find the dollars somewhere. So we need to take a look, every department, top to bottom, take a look at what we need to do, what we don't need to do, how we measure our success, uh, the, what are the metrics of that, and, and, uh, and make sure that we're only spending the money we need to in order to achieve our goals. You know, very recently, my colleagues uh, voted to spend $13 million to purchase a building which will result in the construction of an elementary school, which we all support. The question I asked of my colleagues is that why are we voting on this today before we have an opportunity to review an independent appraisal? Because that particular <coughs> property was assessed at $5.7 million, yet we're spending $13 million, did not provide the public with an opportunity uh, for a hearing, and voted on it uh, without the benefit of an independent appraisal. That's another example of how money is wasted. Uh, back in the year 2000, the Boston City Council approved a loan order to construct a high school. At that point, the high school would have cost $57 million, and back then, the state would have reimbursed 90%. Yeah, well, so it would have cost $6 million. Today, that same the, facility... The fire department is $175 million. And let me just press you on this one way. Sure. I mean, is the union so intimidating that people don't want to push back on them? I would say no. And a lot of it does depend on who the mayor happens to be. Um, I don't think there's anyone in city government who will accuse Charles Yancey of being afraid to stand up to anyone. And I will certainly challenge the unions, but I will also challenge the rest of our bureaucracy to make sure that they understand that they work for the public and not the other way right. around. I'm sorry, sorry Charles Clemens isn't here. He declined to show up for some reason. But uh, he has charged, as I'm sure you've seen, that the Boston Police Department is racist. I'm wondering if either of you shares that view. Well, what I would say is that uh, we've had many instances in the history of the Boston Police Department where, to be kind, they've been very insensitive. Uh, most, I would say 99.9% .9 of our police officers treat everyone with dignity and respect. But we've had instances where they even abuse fellow members of the police department. There was an incident not that long ago at the B3 police station where there was racist graffiti inside of the station. That is not acceptable. So but is the I, would, I, would, I, would, I would insist, as mayor of Boston, that we have a system in place that not only requires all of our police officers to, uh, to be culturally uh, uh, appropriate in dealing with people, but also have a system of checks and balances where we have a civilian review board if individual police officers mm -hmm abuse the authority, but our police officers deserve the support of the public. They risk their lives every day, right. and yeah, I, I certainly... Wait, you know, I, I think the issue on this is really about leadership, and it always is about leadership as far as I'm concerned. The, um, the reality for me is that we have Ed Davis, who would, uh, has told, in fact, it was in the Boston Globe uh, yesterday morning, I believe, or this morning, where... Um, the Mass talking, Association of Minority Law. That was right, Manlio, the Manlio, yeah. his response to Manlio, about you know that he he in fact when he's able to um, to appoint uh, leadership, he appoints a very diverse leadership. I think the bigger issue here is that we have uh, an archaic system of civil and civil service, and the archaic system is that we have this test that determines whether someone can be promoted or not, and it's a numerical score. Now I don't know a CEO in America that would say, oh, I'm going to you know I'm running a biotech company 
and I, I need to choose the best people to run my company. So I'm going to give them a test, and the people that score the highest numbers are going to get the, the job as uh, the chief operating officer, chief financial officer. No, that's not how it happens. What we need to do is make sure that we're able to allow our superintendent of police or commissioner of police to be able to hire a good team of people that will lead the organization. But and I've asked the governor, I've asked the, the governor to, to, uh, to convene the Civil Service Commission to be able to take a look at a different way that we can do this. So harm, you know, we need to make sure there's good chemistry between the leadership of, of the police department. We need to make sure that they're responsive to the community and understand the cultures that they're dealing with, including the police culture that okay. they're dealing but with. Wait, 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 Charles, not, let me ask you this. Hold it's on. Not this, simply civil service. The, the minority law enforcement associate officers say that they're not going to endorse anyone who keeps on Ed Davis because they believe, you know, the balance of power is, is completely out of whack. Um, are you looking for their endorsement? Well, first of all, they don't endorse any candidate. They're a nonprofit, 501c3. So the answer to your question is no, I am not seeking the endorsement of Mamlio. However, uh, I happen to agree with them that we've had many examples where there have been missed opportunities to promote a more diverse command staff. There's been missed opportunities to address instances where the, uh, the, it's pretty obvious that there's disparate treatment within the police department. And invariably, uh, officers of color seem to get okay. meted out greater punishment than others. Ed Davis said today in the paper that Bill was referring to, he said that Mamlio has not proposed any legislation or undertaken any valuable initiatives to help either its own members or the community. Would you agree I disagree. That? They have uh, routine recruitment programs to encourage the diversity in the police department. They've offered recommendations to the police commissioner and to the city of Boston. They've actually testified in city council hearings on the issue of diversity. So I think that they're getting a bad rap. And I, I couldn't disagree with uh, Commissioner Davis more. And we have to stop finger pointing and admit, as the commissioner will admit, if he looks at even his civilian staff, who are not based on civil service, that there's a lack of diversity. The top 10 percent salary positions in police in the police department and many other departments, incidentally, are dominated by white males who represent roughly 25 percent of the population but have 80 and 90 percent of the highest paying jobs. Well, I that's, think that's not I, what he's saying. I, well, that's and he's incorrect. And so are yeah. you. If Bill, you believe I'm, I'm sure both of you have sure. signed onto the website Blackstonian, and their mission mm -hmm. has been to track shootings, murders since. Uh, the, the, the marathon bombings in, in April. Since that time, there have been 128 shootings. Some of them have been fatal, of course. Their basic point here is that the same kinds of resources are not put into tracking, tracing, trying to solve murders in uh, communities of color as there were directed towards finding the perpetrators of the marathon bombing. Is that a fair analogy? Well, of, of course it's fair. We typically don't have... Uh... Homeland Security and the FBI engaged in, in tracking down uh, people that shoot people in, in uh, Dorchester or Roxbury. But it goes beyond Homeland Security. No, excuse me, finish. excuse me, Charles. Um, the issue for us is that you know we have a situation in the city where there's been a lot of shootings, and it tends to be in my, you know, our neighborhood of Dorchester or Mattapan or Roxbury. And it's pretty clear that we need to change the way in which we engage our own communities around these issues now. I, you know, I think what we need to do is we need to reconstitute what worked very effectively in the 1990s, where we had a collaboration between community organizations. Uh, you know, I, I was involved in it through the Cobbman Square Health Center in the day. But, you know, the community organizations, uh, schools, uh, the police department, parole, probation, nonprofit organizations, where we are able to identify the families that are likely to be engaged in violent activities. Uh, and be able to do some sort of crisis intervention with those families to try to get to people. Uh, my wife is a Boston public school teacher, and she would often come back from the first couple of weeks of school and say that she knew these kids were coming from terrible, terrible families where there was, you know, clearly there was a big problem and something needed to be done. Well, if we have that kind of early warning system, we should be able to do something about it. We should be able to have crisis intervention and be able to work with the families that are, that are in trouble. Um, but ultimately, the, you know, the goal of, of city government should be to make sure that the young people that are growing up are able to get good jobs, because good jobs, good careers will result in more hope, and kids with more hope are less likely to turn to drug activity, gang activity, and violence. I'm going to have to jump in here and get some equal time. 
because you've got, I've got you plenty you got I more than enough. I, be, I believe yeah. I believe that my good friend misses the whole point of your question, which was about but, resources. Yes, resources and how they're applied. There are countless examples where we've had homicides in the city of Boston, and the response is very disparate. Give an example. And it's not it's not just the question. Well, listen, I don't want to you know dredge up uh, agony for the many families. The Odom family, Stephen Odom, was uh, a, a, a very young teenager. And it took a while before we were able to solve that particular crime. My point is that if you take a look at the response to that horrific homicide that took place in South Boston with a beautiful young lady, compare that with the response to several other homicides in other parts of the city, you have to reach the conclusion that one life appeared to be valued higher than well, One was a sexual predator others. still on the loose. Yes. There's a little bit of a difference. And no, Steve, no, the no. Sexual, excuse was, me. Was sex, very, sexual very sexual predators are in every community. And I'm just saying that, and in, in, in that particular case, that predator was actually uh, caught and then released. The victim was, was a, a non-white person. But... I believe that whether we like to admit it or not, that we live in a society that unfortunately uh, has, it still has, it suffers from forms of racism and sexism, and we cannot put a blind eye to it. And that's all, I, the, know, more, Charles, that's all the more reason, don't, Charles, interrupt, I, don't interrupt me, that's all the more reason for us to ensure that we have diversity at all levels of government in terms of interacting with people. Right. So, Charles, I, you know, I, there's no doubt about it. We, you know, we have 128 shootings. We need to deploy the resources necessary. We probably need to reorganize those departments to make sure that we are dealing with it, because this is clearly a serious issue in our city. We need to have the kind of resources necessary. What I was pointing to is that there's a long-term and a short-term solution to the issue of violence in our city, and that we need to deploy both of those, not just in terms of and getting I'm not the police. Excuse, excuse me, excuse me, Charles. I'm not disagreeing excuse with that. Excuse me, Charles. Right, the really? Let him finish. Hey, the Charles, right, Charles. Let him finish, Charles. Charles. The question, the I respectfully question. listen to you, okay? So what well, I'm not, saying is not, that we not, need... Not so, wait, wait. because you interrupt me. Right, go ahead, go ahead and finish. Okay. Uh, what I'm saying is that, you know, that there are clearly, there are a multi-prong aspect of w what we need to do as a city in order to be able to deal with the safe to public safety issue. And that policing is a, ma is a major part of it, because when there is a crime that is committed, we need to make sure we have the appropriate resources deployed to make sure we can solve those crimes. But we also need to be looking at the prevention strategy. As a person that, that worked 37 years in public health, I can tell you that there's nothing more important than prevention in dealing with these issues. And you don't need to lecture me. I've been in office 30 years. I'm well aware, but the question had to do with the issue of disparate treatment, which you have avoided. All no, I'm, I did all avoid I'm, it. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. All I'm saying is this. We, at our peril, ignore the reality at least the perceived reality of a healthy proportion of people who live in the city of Boston. Jamal Crawford of Blackstonian put his finger on it when he not only dealt with the issue of shootings in the city of Boston, but the lack of representation of women and people of color in positions of authority throughout city government. That's what we're talking about. I, I, I certainly, I certainly, have, I certainly have proposed that we take some steps to preempt the violence I mean, I advocate hiring of 300 mentors to interact with our young people before they get into trouble. I believe violence is a public health issue, and we have to intervene in the lives of our young people, provide the families with necessary information. Okay, I want to move on here. If you're just joining us on radio, you're listening to a Boston Mayoral Forum special. I'm Emily Rooney, and I'm joined here by candidates Bill Walzak and Charles Yancey. Tonight's third candidate, Charles Clemens declined to show up. And we are hosting the other candidates later in the week. I, just okay. one more yes. uh, question on crime, because I'm sure you both saw in the paper today that the uh, state Supreme Judicial Court is uh, considering uh, supporting a prohibition on life sentences for juveniles committed, uh, convicted of really heinous crimes, like, like the John Odgan case out in uh, Sudbury. W without parole. Right now, they're committed to life in prison without parole. They would want to end that. How do you feel about that? Well, I, I think that uh, 
people are juveniles, um, obviously in a different category uh, than adults. And there's a reason why we have a ju juvenile justice system that's different from the adult justice system. Now, I don't want to see uh, people that have committed heinous crimes uh, be let out uh, uh, with, with very little sentencing. But I do think that it's a responsible thing to do, to take a look at how we, you know, what, what happens as a child grows up in, in the prison system and whether there's a chance of reform. I think that that's, that's something that we owe the, our system to be able to allow them to evaluate whether this is a reasonable approach or not. So, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also opposed to, like, uh, three strikes and you're outlaws um, because it, it just doesn't give enough flexibility to the system to be able to make determinations long uh, later after the... Uh, after the sentence actually occurred. Charles? I certainly don't agree with that. I don't disagree with that. You don't agree with what? With what Bill just said about the, uh, the sentencing uh, issue around life sentences. Because I believe we have a crisis in this country where our prisons are really overpopulated. Many people who are in prison should perhaps be in, in institutions of uh, public health, mental health, uh, drug, uh, drug treatment centers. We have a society that is locking up millions of people and throwing away the key. And I believe that we must come up with a different approach to deal with violence in our society and to deal with drug addiction, because much of the crime that we face in the city of Boston is directly attributed to drug addiction. So I would, for it's example, I, answer, I, would, I would, don't interrupt me, I would suggest that we take a different approach to law enforcement, that we not only intervene to preempt the violence, but uh, treat drug addiction as an illness and prescribe uh, remedies appropriately rather than simply locking people up uh, because of their addiction. Would you consider you legalizing some of these drugs and just take the problem out away altogether? Well, I know that uh, you know the voters of Massachusetts have spoken marijuana. on the issue of marijuana. Uh, you know, perhaps. Uh, some but should we decriminalize well. some of these users and that kind of thing? Well, we should certainly look or at it. Or even dealing. We, we, should, we should look at decriminalizing This Operation some H swept up all these people on Humboldt yes. Avenue you know, f five months ago, and they're all back on the street, or they yes. met bail. It made no I, difference. Well, I, I firmly believe that, uh, that drugs have to be considered very differently, and I do think that, uh, that what we need is we need to have interventions for drug addicts, and it's the wrong place to put them is prison. If there are opportunities to put people who are addicted to drugs into uh, safe beds, uh, places where they can be rehabilitated, I am totally in favor of that. I think it's, a, it's not a criminal justice issue necessarily. It needs to be a, uh, seen as a, a health issue, as a public health issue. And I'm going to move on to casinos, which is really not my favorite discussion, but it seems to be the <laughs> hot is. button of uh, um, this mayoral campaign so far. So last night, uh, Bill Walczak, well, all of you were at a, uh, uh, a Boston Herald um, forum, and uh, you were talking about how uh, it was actually the arts forum. You were talking about how um, casinos would cut into the arts in Boston. Here's a little bit of what you had to say. When casinos come into cities, what they do is they suck the lifeblood out of the arts community. They offer opportunities for different artists to be over there, and you know what happens with the casinos is they don't, once you go in, they don't want you to let you out. And so what happens is that uh, in every city where a casino has been uh, located, the arts community has suffered, including upwards of 50% lower revenue because of the fact that the casinos are driving business in that direction so that people will go there instead of to our local community artists. Besides the fact that it's hard for me to imagine that somebody, there's an either or, I'm going to go to the MFA or I'm going to a casino, what about if East if ever it gets the casino, it's still only another half a mile away from Boston, so it would cut into the arts in the Boston area with none of the benefits. So at least if it were in Boston, we would still be getting some of the benefits of the revenue, and it still might cut into the arts community, but if it went to Everett, none. Well, I mean, there is a third proposal, uh, Milford, that's, uh, that's, um, that's, that's a third proposal. I I'm opposed to casinos on a number of grounds. The arts community had its... Uh, um, event last night, a forum to talk to the, uh, to the people that are running for mayor. And so I wanted to point out the fact that in every city where a casino has been located, the arts community has suffered, that the amount of revenue going into arts, artists and, and local community arts programmings has gone down. And, uh, and it's directly related to when the casino has, has gone in. Um, because so, people are spending their expendable income on casinos or they're going are, to see art 
they're going to see right. musicians. And in fact, and um, in fact the, the head of uh, uh, Caesar's Palace said that, you know, we are a big artist group. We bring arts into yeah. our community, and we want people to visit it. I suppose people have a limited amount of dollars that they have available to do to go to these types of venues, and, and they'll decide to, to go to the casino for it because it's usually, um, it's usually discounted. They want to bring people in there so that they'll stay there, so they'll listen to the music, and then they'll go gambling. And then they don't put windows or, or uh, clocks on the wall so that people <laughs> don't have an understanding of when they're leaving. But the issue really for me is that, you know, first of all, um, what we're doing is we're allowing, a, if we allow this, we're allowing a casino to come into the city of Boston um, and we're going to be bringing, we know what happens when that happens. There's a reason why there's the... Um, why the mayor has signed an agreement that's called a mitigation agreement. The reason why is because it's mitigating crime, vice, and gambling addiction. Now, it would be different if the city of Boston desperately needed those kinds of jobs. But in fact, Boston is a magnet for jobs right now. So there's two points for me. From a public health perspective, we don't want to encourage d gambling addiction. It's as bad addic as an addiction as any other kind of addiction. But we also have an opportunity to build an additional innovation um, district there, which would recruit, would, which would be able to recruit businesses to locate there and create jobs that are good paying jobs. The average casino job pays $22,400 a year. An innovation district job, a typical, is but about $40,000. But that ship has sailed. The legislature has already approved the building of it. No, no, that's not true. That, that's, that's not true. The legislature approved the gambling uh, legislation. And the gambling legislation says that there needs to be a mitigation agreement and a vote, at which point the decision goes to the gaming commission, and next April they'll make a decision oh, no, as to which, saying, which license they're no, going no, to no, issue. No, 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 but they've already decided there's <clears throat> going to be a casino. Emily, in Metropolitan you, yeah, Boston Metropolitan somewhere. Yes. Emily, right. you have it right. Uh, we know that uh, casinos are no panacea, and I agree with Bill of some of the negatives of these casinos, but... It's obvious to me that the casino is going to either be in Boston or in Everett. If, not it, if it's placed, no, I, I'm not a fan of Milford. I hope, hopefully they're not watching. <laughs> if it goes to Everett, then we suffer all the negative ills of a casino with very few benefits. So if we're going to have a casino in greater Boston, I'd rather have it in the city of Boston where we can negotiate those agreements, including the mitigation agreements. And I think they should go beyond East Boston, incidentally, because people from throughout the city of Boston uh, are likely to use that casino and suffer uh, the cost of doing so. Uh, I also believe that when a vote is taken, it should be a citywide vote because the taxpayers of Boston will have to foot the bill for the increased public safety and perhaps public health costs related to this. I think everyone should be in the city of Boston should be able to weigh in too, on right? this issue. I, I believe in the, there should be a citywide vote, but I believe that we should stop the casino yeah. because we don't, why would we want to bring in vice, crime, drugs, uh, and uh, gambling addiction into our city when we don't need it? People don't come to Boston because they want to uh, gamble. You know, we're not going to see people flying in from Dubai or Paris to come to Boston to, to gamble. We have people coming to Boston because we have great institutions, healthcare institutions, universities, we have history. That's why people come to Boston. And I agree The target with that. for the casinos will be the people who live on the subway line, who are going to be able to get on one uh, on the orange line or the red line and get over to the Suffolk Downs and be able to gamble. Why well, can't you have we your innovation hub, too, as and, well? And can we have another we parts can. of the city of Boston that are desperately in need of that type of development? Yes. The people who are going to the casino, who likely go to the casino, are also going to Foxwood and Mahegan Sun. Why not, not on the subway, why not, I didn't say the subway. You, not, right. no, you said not the gonna, subway. Yeah. I'm just saying the people from Boston the are going... Subway. Well, really? Thanks for that. You're a brilliant guy. Uh, the just people, the the obvious, people in Boston, the people, many people in Boston do travel to Foxwood and Mahegan and, and elsewhere. So we have the opportunity to retain some of that income as well that, that leaves the city of Boston to go to those other mm -hmm. venues. And gambling addiction. And gambling and crime, addiction. And crime. And vice. By and the vice. way, uh, yes. one of your uh, challengers, um, Marty Walsh, wants to establish an office of recovery services. I mean, so wouldn't you be creating the problem and then solving it well, by we, yet another we need, layer of We need those recovery services today, even without the, the casino. Why? And that will, 
because we, we, we have, have we hospitals have, and resources and, and what does we the don't, city have and to we do don't have adequate number of beds for people who are addicted to drugs and i believe that we need to increase the number of beds in that area but should uh, that be the, the city's responsibility the 20 million or the dollars in it mitigation the dollars that should the, the public's uh, responsibility that, that Suffolk Downs is offering the city of boston will be easily spent on police overtime and gambling addiction services that will have to be provided by the Boston Public Health Commission. That's what's going to happen to the money. So the, why we would ever do that, why we would ever create the problem and then use the dollars to mitigate the, uh, the problems that are being created, when we can avoid it altogether and create good jobs, to me is a complete mystery. I don't understand why right. we are even entertaining the possibility of a casino in Boston. All right, moving on here to what I'm calling the nuisance round. We're all <laughs> Bostonians, so there's a long list. I'm sure you have items on your list because I don't live in your neighborhood, you don't live in mine. But here's one that I think, Charles, you brought this up. This is pretty universal in the city. Charles, you have said that um, when you become mayor, you want to make uh, the city the cleanest in the world. I'd like to know how you're going to stop that when okay. right now no one who smokes ever thinks about extinguishing their cigarette anywhere but on the ground, especially around the sidewalks and, you know, the tourist area. It's all yes. in between the cobblestones and everything. Everybody drops their coffee cups. Yes. And they have somewhat fixed the problem of the overstuffed litter boxes, but on Marathon Weekend or something like that, it's a nightmare. How do you get into the, 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 into the minds and hearts and souls of Bostonians that it's not okay to drop your litter Well, that's an excellent question, and I believe that we can do it. And I think that we have to lead by example, not just the mayor, but the 17,000 employees working for city government can play a role in keeping the city clean. We have to invest more in the Hokies so that every commercial district has someone who takes a special pride in maintaining those areas. And I have to commend uh, the organizers of the bid uh, for, uh, for downtown Boston. They are doing a very good job. Not only are they keeping the area clean, but they're also contributing. Where is this? To, in downtown Boston. Oh. Business Improvement District. Well, maybe that, but certainly not in the Newberry, Boylston Street area. It's, it's well, All right, moving it, on to it, other, other so it is nemeses possible. and nuisances. Okay. <laughs> Segways, Bill Walzak, would you ban them altogether or allow them to go up and down certain sidewalks under rest in restricted areas? Um, I, I, you know, I've seen them on the sidewalks. Uh, I think that they travel too fast to be on sidewalks. It's the same reason why we don't allow bicycles on sidewalks. I think we should, you know, if they're going to be going anywhere, they should be considered motor vehicles and be on our roadways, I suppose. The big issue, I guess, is whether they should be banned altogether from Boston. And I know that there's some neighborhoods that would love to see them go away permanently. I think the North End uh, in particular. Uh, and it may be there's certain sections of the city where it's just too crowded to do it. I mean, this is the kind of thing where you really need to have the community weigh in. It's, it's about planning. It's about master planning our city. And, uh, and I do think that it's important for, uh, for people to be able to weigh in. If it's a nuisance, hey, then don't have it. You know, there are probably other sections of the city where it's not a nuisance. but Huge nuisance. <laughs> motorcycles and motorcycle noise. They come in <laughs> absolutely. Uh, with absolutely all, you know, with the aftermarket pipes, and they're roaring up and down yes. the tourist areas. People yes. can't hear themselves think. Yeah. How th There are rules and regulations. They are not enforced. What would well, you do I to certainly do would enforce all of our noise ordinances, for example, as well as all the ordinances we have regulating scooters. Uh, there's uh, not just the motorcycles, but you may recall, 10 years ago, we were invaded by these mini scooters that looked like they were about four inches above the, razors the ground. The you're talking about? Yes. Um, and I got legislation passed to require anyone on a scooter must not only they have a helmet. Noise. No, they don't. But they are <laughs> a tremendous hazard to pedestrians yeah. and to themselves. So I got a law passed which says that they have to have a helmet. No one under a certain age can operate them. They needed a driver's license. And we did have our police enforcing that. We can enforce the noise with regards to motorcycles as well. Uh, it's difficult, but, uh, but it is doable, All particularly right. if... Next nuisance. i got to move along. Says, yeah. Take care. Parades, rallies. They're in the <laughs> same neighborhoods, you know, sometimes weekend after weekend after weekend, including this past weekend, there was one that I think was a follow-up to the marathon bombing, which is fine. I'm all in support of that. But there's mm -hmm. no signage anywhere to let you know that Copley Square is closed. You're in the Prude Tunnel. You come out. You take a left. You are instantly in traffic for another 25 minutes because you've got yes. to go around and around and around. Is there any way to, A, limit some of those things and make better notice for people? Yeah, one of the things that kind of drives me crazy is that we don't have 
a way of warning people when they're, like, for instance, about to get into a huge traffic jam. There should be some kind of sign. I mean, you know, we have signs all over the place. Now we know how long it takes to get to the Braintree mm -hmm. interchange on the expressway. It'll say, you know, <laughs> seven miles, eight minutes, or whatever. You know, we need to, if there's going to be a parade, if there's going to be a special event, part of the deal should be that you put a sign up that allows you to at least know that you can avoid this if you keep going straight and get off at South Station or whatever. But I do think that that's a, it's a real nuisance. I wish on the expressway heading into town that there was a sign before that big bend that would say, hey, you're about to head into Don't a really big traffic jam. <laughs> get off now while you still can. All right. But I enjoy those celebrations, and I know Bill and that's I not, agree. That's fine. I enjoy yes. the celebrations. Right. I just, yes. If I don't want to avoid it, I just want to be able to. <laughs> right. Public bathrooms, yes. Charles Hansey. Yes. We did an unofficial survey that was absolutely shocking. And they don't work. They're disgusting. All those self-cleaning mechanisms are bogus. They don't work. The city is making a fortune off the licensing. The, the people who manufacture them are making a fortune off the advertising. And you can't use the bathroom. I say cancel the contracts if they're not maintaining them. I mean, we have worked with an organization called The Wall. They made all sorts of yep. commitments to us. As mayor of Boston, I will enforce every contract. And if uh, those bathrooms aren't being maintained, then we'll put, the, put it out to bid again to find uh, a vendor who could do a better job. Yeah. All right. I have many more nuisances, so we've got <laughs> to move on to some other things. All right. If you're just joining us on radio, you're listening to a Boston mayoral forum special. I'm Emily Rooney, and I'm joined here by candidates Bill Walzak and Charles Yancey. Tonight's third candidate, Charles Clemens, declined to show up. We're hosting the other candidates later in the week. Moving on to some of the uh, Im important issues here, education. Um, many people have said it's just, a, I think yourself included, it's, it's a huge bureaucracy, more so than in other agencies. And isn't it because it is so large and it's hard to wrap one's hands around? I mean, how would you like to be, wouldn't you rather be the mayor than the superintendent of schools? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yes, of course. Uh, the school bureaucracy is a very complex bureaucracy, and it doesn't need to be. Um, one of the things that we have learned is that successful schools are driven by really successful principles. Um, so, you know, my plan for education really is about starting from pregnancy, because I strongly believe that one of the problems that we have in the city of Boston is that so many children entering our school system are not prepared to enter school. They're not, they have not been prepared appropriately to enter school. So, but it's the healthcare system that deals with children from the age of, well, from pregnancy up until age five there, or thereabouts. And so what we need to do is make sure that we're connecting the healthcare system to the education system. So we're dealing with, especially in impoverished families, with the issues of, of um, adverse childhood experiences that often lead to trauma, which can affect brain development. And if the doctors and the principals and the teachers and nurses are working together, they can make sure the children are actually prepared to enter school. We also need to make sure in this city that we have early childhood education. We know that two years of good early childhood education will result in a 30 percent increase in the uh, graduation rate from high school. We need to make sure that the schools are where the change happens and that they're led by great principals who lead great teams of teachers. We need to have tutors in every school to make sure that the children don't fall behind. And finally, what I'd like to do is I'd like to create 11th and 12th grade academies in our city so that every high school actually has a track into a career, whether it's a track into, you know, like sort of vocational education, plumbing, electricity, or a pre-pre-med high school, or a uh, telecommunications, biotech, high tech, whatever. We have the potential in our city to do this because we have such great resources. My plan for the city, uh, city schools is to make sure that every child in high school has a chance for hope for a career. And that will also deal with the issue of criminal justice. Yeah, and you public you've rightly said that we are woefully uh, undermanned when it comes to high schools. We, we, yes. we, Boston yes. needs a high school. But, but I, I, I want to address the issue as well because um, Hillary Clinton told us of, of the old African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. And I know uh, certainly Bill agrees with this. We must all uh, consider education to be everyone's business. Um, f since 1987, uh, my wife, staff, and I have been hosting an annual book fair. Not a big deal. Uh, we pull families together. We give them book bags and brand new books. We've been doing this since 1987. We're in the 27th year. We've distributed 570,000 new books to families, primarily pre-K. And we run into families almost every day in the course of this campaign for mayor where we run into individuals who started as a youngster, 
graduated from uh, high school and then college, and they point to the fact that it was the encouragement that we gave them by providing them books to build their own libraries and to become independent thinkers that contributed to it. Small thing, but very important. Everyone can buy a book for a young person. Yeah. preferably read to them. And I don't disagree with anything that Bill just said in terms of about what needs to happen. I would add, however, that far too many people have been disengaged from the school system when we went from an elected school committee to an appointed one. Let that Tommy was going to be my next question. Do you think we should go back to I an elected? I think we should have an elected school system like all the remember successful... Remember what a morass that was, Charles? Me, excuse me. <laughs> I remember. Excuse me. Uh, Every other city and town in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts... That wasn't my question. Well, I'm, Remember I'm what answering, the political I'm, machinations I'm not talking about going back. I'm talking about going forward. I mean, if the appointed school committee was so great, we would not have any major problems in the school system today. We still have upwards of 1,000 people a year drop, dropping out... Don't interrupt me. Out, dropping out of school. And I believe that in a elected school committee would engage more of our voters to take more of a stake what's going on. And by the way... No mayor, Mayor Yancey or anyone else will have a monopoly of knowledge or wisdom in terms of dealing with the schools. And I don't believe that a mayor is going to lose his or her seat because of the performance of the schools. What we need to do is to get more people reengaged. And, and we also have a law that was passed in 1994 that says that parents can take three days off of their jobs to visit their schools during school hours. It's called the Parental School Leave Ordinance, and I believe by engaging more parents in the school system, we will assist our children to become more successful uh, in their academic careers. So, yeah, well, let me, let me tell you about the elected versus the appointed school committee. I remember the elected school committee. There were some good people on it, but I also remember all the indictments. And I do remember how destabilizing the elected school committee was for the school system itself. If there's one thing that was really important about creating an appointed school committee was the fact that we had more stability in the leadership. When we had a, uh, an elected school committee, what we had was tremendous change on a regular basis, superintendent after superintendent after superintendent who would bring in their new leadership team, and as a result, there was chaos in the system. What we've been able to do by having an appointed school committee is bring more stability into the school system, which is really essential if you're going to be able to move an agenda forward. You've got to have stability. We definitely need stability, but we need stability with regards to each of our schools. Now, there's an exam school in the city of Boston which had more than a half dozen headmasters in the past seven years. That's not stability. That's not stability. Yes, we've had a... a stability with the superintendent, but we still have far too many underperforming schools in the city of Boston, so much so that folks are gravitating towards charter schools, similar to the one that my friend created. And I believe we have to invest in the Boston public schools. One of the things that happened under an elected school committee, which doesn't happen anymore, and I'm an authority on this, when we hosted hearings on the school department, we could not do that without having some members of the elected school committee advocating for the school department's budget. Since we had an appointed school committee for the last two decades, it is rare that any member, any appointed member of the school committee will come to the city council or even challenge the mayor on allocations to the mm. school department. We need more advocates for the schools, and we lost that under the appointed school committee. And We've had, many, we've had many successful students out of the Boston public school system under an elected right. school committee, on. just yeah. as we do in suburban areas where, where they get to elect their school committee. All right. If you're just joining us on radio, you're listening to a mayoral forum. I'm Emily Rudy. I'm joined here by candidates Bill Walzak and Charles Yancey. Tonight's third candidate, Charles Clemens, did not show up. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, Mayor Menino this week announced uh, a goal to build 30,000 um, new housing units by 2020. He released his blueprint, and he said that before. This time he actually released a blueprint. Do you feel like this is a lame duck agenda, Bill, or is this something you would embrace and move forward if you were uh, to become mayor? I think it's really important that the mayor be, uh, Mayor Menino, be very well aware of the fact that he's not going to be there as in January, which is only a few months away. And therefore, I'm not opposed to continuing the 
machinery of city government to continue to plan, to be able to understand how to develop things. But I would like for the mayor to allow the next mayor to be able to evaluate how these things are going to come together and be able to figure out how it's going to happen. It's just the same thing with the mitigation agreement with the, uh, with, about the casino. It's like, you know, planning this thing, making it happen, and then leaving it to the next mayor to implement it is not very fair to the next mayor. So although I would say that it's very, very important that we have uh, the units of housing developed, I would like to make sure that what we're doing is we're doing it in a methodical way and leaving enough for so that the next mayor can manage the how this is going to happen. And so I'd ask him to slow down especially slow down in allocating the, the licenses for building these major buildings that are going in downtown Boston. Just slow it down a bit and see what can happen because I think what we're doing is we're approving many, many new projects for downtown Boston and I don't think all of them are going to be able to be built because it's a lot of projects that are being approved right now. We need to make sure that it fits in with an overall scheme, an overall goal for, for the city of Boston and how many units and where they're going. And that's going to, you know, with the redeveloped Boston Redevelopment Authority, we're going to have an opportunity to revisit that whole agreement. And so please, Mr. Mayor, slow down, let be more methodical about it, leave more of this to the next mayor to implement. Would you embrace it, Charles Yancey? Well, we know that we're going to be stuck with it anyhow, whichever way it goes, whether he's active on promoting this or not. I, I'm concerned even with what the mayor proposed because I don't think we have enough, uh, enough units allocated for low-income residents. Uh, and I believe that we should develop a formula that creates an environment where more current residents of the city of Boston can afford to live here. The rents are exorbitant. Uh, before you know it, every neighborhood of Boston will be gentrified, and only people uh, like Bill Walzak will be able to live here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm living <laughs> here. Um, enforcing residency requires char requirements, Charles. I mean, yes. We're, we've talked so much out of that we've priced people out of yes. the market other than fairly affluent and yes. poor people and middle yes. class are having a hard time moving into the yes. city unless they're gonna, willing to be in outlying parts of the city. How would you enforce those residency requirements and is it really necessary? Well, I would say yes to both questions. Unfortunately, we were hopeful that by enforcing residency we would not need it in the future, but the reality is that every day Roughly 500,000 people come to Boston to get the best paying jobs. And unfortunately, even within city government, many of our departments have uh, uh, more than 30% of people who don't live in the, in the city of Boston, you know, because of different negotiated agreements and contracts, etc. I believe that Boston residents should be given the opportunity to work jobs work in the jobs of providing public service. And that's limited mm -hmm. by the fact that uh, we have a lot of good, committed people who happen to be suburban. Okay, would you support that, Who are that, taking Bill? jobs that Boston residents can, can I do, do support it. residents. You would require yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm uh, saddened that uh, the mayor um, negotiated out uh, the police so that the police could uh, leave after 10 years. I think it's really important that we have our police force living in the city limits. Okay, a couple of questions I put in the miscellaneous category, oh, okay. and I want quick answers here. Sure. How do you feel about gender-neutral bathrooms, public gender-neutral bathrooms? It's been an issue uh, in the State House. It's been debated, uh, yes or no? At the Cobham Square Health Center, we only had gender-neutral uh, bathrooms. Outside, I mean, out, you know. Yeah, yeah I believe in gender-neutral bathrooms. I think that's, um, I would say, unfortunately, the wave of the future. I think it's inevitable. So, yes, I, I would, uh, I would support, support those. that. Yeah. What about these parklets that are going up in certain communities, taking away two parking places, Putting these, uh, you know, rolling out the side with a couple of benches, is it condescending in a way or is it charming? I don't think it's charming. I, I would definitely not uh, go forward with them. I, you know, hey, some people might get a kick out of uh, sitting in a, on grass in a parking lot, space, but I can't imagine that it's worth the money. Yeah, is it a waste of par good parking or? Well, I, uh, listen, we all support greenery. I think we should be planting more, more trees in our areas in addition to those little parklets. So, so you support the parklets? I'm not opposed to that, no. Yeah. I'm not. Yeah. What about this idea that you know, closing down nightclubs or closing down some of these electronic music shows is a way of combating the use of the drug Molly? Is that a way to proceed, Bill? I, I don't think so. I mean, these clubs existed before there was Molly, and there wasn't Molly. So I, I think it's uh, more important that we educate 
the, the people that have potential for using it and also educate the people that are running these clubs to make sure that they're very well aware of it. The fact that they pulled the license from, uh, from one of the clubs uh, is an indicator of how serious this is, and I think it'll send a, a shockwave across the entire system to make sure that we are very well monitoring how uh, drugs are used within our clubs. And I agree with Superintendent Flynn of our police department. Um, I don't believe that it's practical uh, to regulate uh, that type of activity with, within uh, any of our establishment, but it does go to the point of management. Now, if we can see a pattern of abuse, not only with that drug, but with any drug, then certainly uh, that institution, that facility should be subjected to suspension. Right, I want to end on something a little more fun. Good. <laughs> Would you, Charles Yancey, support a 2024 bid for the Summer Olympics here in Boston? I would enthusiastically support it. It would be a major, require a major investment on the part of the people of Boston, but I think it would be worth it because we can plan uh, for life in Boston after the Olympics is here and provide facilities that may even help us with a, a brand new uh, high school facility. That can be yeah, one yeah. of the That's venues. That's a ways away, though. That, could, right. that could be one I of the venues. The Walls Act, 2024 Olympics. <laughs> well, here's the issue for me. I think that most of the time they're, they cost way too much money to pr provide for... Uh, to be able to provide for the Olympics to be theirs. But Boston is in a really interesting position in that we have all of these, for, for summer Olympics, we have all these universities with all these dorm rooms and lots and lots of uh, uh, field facilities that could be used. I think we could package something that's a very low cost alternative. If we're able to package that, then I'd be in favor of it. If not, no. Probably not. All right. Yeah. Charles Yancey My and pleasure. Bill Walzak, thank you so much for coming here tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thank form. you for having us, and I appreciate it. your support on, on September, right. September 24th right. from Charles Yancey for mayor. All right. Well, Number that two on the ballot, Bill Walzak. <laughs> concludes our second Boston Mayoral Forum. forum. I want to thank both of you, Bill Walzak and Charles Yancey. As you said at the start, even if you don't live in Boston, the city plays a vital role in our region's economy. The next mayor will have influence well beyond the city limits. So please come back tomorrow night. I'll be joined here by Dan. Ann Conley, John Connolly, and Charlotte Golar Ritchie. The three remaining candidates will be here on Thursday. If you missed last night's forum, it's available on our website along with all our mayoral election coverage. That's at WGBHnews.org. Just a reminder, as our two candidates here said, September 24th is the date for voting on the preliminary. Thanks for watching on WGBH Channel 2 and listening on 89.7 FM WGBH Radio. I'm Emily Rooney. See you tomorrow night. Good night. I said.